Listening test instructions. The listening test is about 50 minutes. There are six parts in listening test. You will have about six minutes to listen to each passage and answer the questions. The passage will be played once. The use of fake names on social networking sites can also act as barrier to cases being brought before the court. You will hear a conversation in three sections. You will hear each section only once. After each section, you will hear two or three questions. You will hear the questions only once. Choose the best answer to each question. Well, Mary, how does it feel on your first day on campus? I'm a little nervous, actually. It's such a large campus and I'm not quite sure how to get around it. How about you? I feel the same way. That's why I think we should leave early, to get to our history lecture on time. That sounds like a good idea to me. Look, it's 8.15 now. When is the lecture supposed to start, again? Er, in 45 minutes. I know it's early, but better safe than sorry, I guess. We've got to go to the Bradley building, but I'm not sure where that is. Since neither of us seems sure how to get there, why don't we ask that mask that man sitting over there? He looks like he may know his way around there. Question 1. Why are both students are not so confident? Question 2. What was their immediate plan? Question 3. What will they probably do next? You will hear the second section of the conversation shortly. Oh, there is no need. Look, there is the Bradley building opposite to that skyscraper. Oh yes. Well, we've got here in good time. Do you know which theater the lecture is in? It's supposed to be in the lecture theater H, I think. Wherever that is. There are at least 10 floors in this building. Shall we ask somebody for directions again? I don't think we'll need to. There's a directory next to the stairs over there. Let's take a look. Let's see. It says here that lecture theaters A to D are on the 6th floor, theaters E and F are on the 8th floor, and rest of the theaters are on the 10th floor. Shall we take the stairs? Are you serious? I'm not going to walk up all that way. Let's take that escalator over there. Look. You can see it's not moving. If you don't want to walk up, I guess we'll have to find a lift. Actually, I noted a sign when we came into the building that said the lifts weren't working on the ground and first floors. I suppose we'd better take stairs to the second floor and take the lift from there. Question 4. Why do both students sound relaxed?
Question 5. How did they find the location of the lecture theater age? Question 6. How did they reach the required floor? You will hear the third section of the conversation shortly. Okay, let's go. Well, we finally made it. And we exactly started it 40 minutes ago. I hope it doesn't take us so long next time. Yes, if we memorize the way we got here. Hey, William. That's strange, there's no one here. Are you sure this is the right place? Yes, I'm sure. Hey, wait a moment. There's a sign posted on the blackboard. Can you see what it says? Yeah. It says the professor is sick, and that there'll be no lecture today. I guess that means we've come all the way to this lecture theater for nothing. True. Anyways, we have enough time so we can discuss the timetable for the rest table for the rest of the week. Yes, you are right. Let's discuss it. Question 7. What did they find when they reached the theater? Question 8. From the following which statement is true? You will hear a conversation followed by five questions. Listen to each question. You will hear the question only once. Choose the best answer to each question. This is Yummy Coffee, Bob. How is yours? It's excellent. You know, Teresa, I just read an article about coffee last night. It was in that journal that Professor Smith recommended to us. Which one was that? Oh, I think, I know. Food Economics Review, isn't it that? That's the one. Anyway, in the article there were all kinds of interesting things about coffee that I'd never known before. Like what? Well, did you know that over 30 million people earn their living from some aspect of coffee farming? Wow. Well, if it's that big, it's probably produced and controlled by a few large companies just like with oil. Well, this are otherwise. It's said that most coffee is grown by farmers with only 4 or 5 hectares of land. And coffee is usually all they produce. So who produces the most coffee? I mean which country? It depends on what type of coffee bean you are talking about. Oh, of course. Each country's coffee has a different flavor. My fit is Jamaican. What you're talking about? It's just a regional variation. What I'm talking about is the coffee bean itself. One common type of coffee bean is Robusta. It's grown at altitudes of below 600 meters. Is that what we are drinking now? Probably not. The coffee we're drinking is premium quality. Robusta is usually used to make instant coffee. Anyway, the premium coffee, like the stuff we're drinking now, is from a type of bean called Arabica. They grow it higher up at between 600 and 2,000 meters. So those are the two types of coffee, are they? Actually, there's one more called, Librica. It's grown below 1,200 meters. 
but apparently, it's not produced in very large quantities. It's used in blended coffees. You have really collected a lot of information about the coffee. Yes, actually. Question 1. Which source was used by Bob to collect the information about coffee? Question 2. How many types of coffee are discussed here? Question 3. Which of the statements holds true of the conversation? Question 4. Why particular coffee is used? Question 5. One fact about the production of coffee is. You will hear a conversation followed by six questions. Listen to each question. You will hear the question only once. Choose the best answer to each question. Good morning, Dr. Watson. Thank you for finding the time to talk to us. No problem. The pleasure is all mine. Could you first of all give us a short personal introduction? Of course. I am Dr. John Watson. People know me best as the chronicler and narrator of the cases of the greatest detective the world has ever known, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. For a while I shared Mr. Holmes' rooms in Baker Street, London, and accompanied him on many of his criminal cases. Where did you train to be a doctor? In London. I got my degree in medicine, my MD, in 1878 after studying at London University's School of Medicine and Dentistry. Where was your first job? After leave leaving university. I got a position as an assistant surgeon in the British Army. Did you serve abroad? Oh yes. As soon as I joined the army, I was sent to India. Then my regiment was moved to the war zone in Afghanistan. But my career as an army doctor didn't last long. I was wounded at the Battle of Maiwand in 1880. An enemy bullet hit me in the left shoulder, breaking the bone. I lost a lot of blood, but fortunately my servant dragged me out of the battle and back to the army hospital. He saved your life. He did indeed. For weeks, the doctors thought I would not live. I suffered terrible pain from the wound and long attacks of fever. When I did recover, I was very weak and of no further use, use to the army. The doctors decided to send me back to England. My career as an army doctor was finished and my health was in ruins. What happened when you got back to England? Colin I had no relatives or close friends in London. In fact, I had no family at all anywhere. I was completely alone. The army had given me a small pension for nine months not without money. I rented a room in a hotel in central London, but knew I would soon have to find somewhere cheaper. What did you decide to do? One evening, completely by chance, I bumped into one of the hospital workers from my student days. 
He told me he knew someone who was looking for a second person to share a flat in Baker Street. That someone was Sherlock Holmes. The two of us met, and quickly decided that we would be compatible as flatmates. And the rest is, as they say, history. Question 1. What made Dr. Watson popular among the people? Question 2. How was he connected to Sherlock Holmes? Question 3. What was his first job? Question 4. Why was he sent back from army service? Question 5. After leaving army, how did he manage to survive? Question 6. Who introduced the doctor to Mr. Holmes? You will hear a news item once. It is about 1.5 minutes long. Then five questions will appear. Choose the best way to complete each statement from the drop down menu. The New York Times newspaper has apologized for a cartoon on India's Mars mission following readers' complaints that it mocked India. The cartoon showed a farmer with a cow knocking at the door of a room marked Elite Space Club where two men sit reading a newspaper on India's feet. The cartoon was carried with an article India's budget mission to Mars. Last month, India successfully put the Mangalot robotic probe into orbit around Mars. The total cost of the Indian mission was put at $74 million which makes it one of the cheapest interplanetary space missions ever. Only the U.S. Russia and Europe have previously previously sent missions to Mars, and India succeeded in its first attempt, an achievement that eluded even the Americans and the Soviets. Andrew Rosenthal, editorial page editor of the New York Times, wrote in a Facebook post that a large number of readers had complained about the cartoon. The intent of the cartoon the cartoonist, Hank Kim Song, was to highlight how space exploration is no longer the exclusive domain of rich. Western countries, Mr. Rosenthal said.
You will listen to a two minutes video. Then eight questions appear. Choose the best way to answer each question. Hi, Linda. How are you doing? Hello, David. Good to see you too. I have some ideas about our next project. I am momentarily thinking of a wiki music as well, but I think I mean something different. I just would permit free music. At the moment that will mean classical music of people dead over 70 years. And I would like to add three major topics with every music piece, to know the audio, the score and in some cases the text. I believe that's a great idea. This would prefer some kind of wiki notation for notes, but easier than the way as it is now. We can try to prepare a plan, and I would like to hear more ideas, what people think of it. What do you suggest, Linda? I think we should approach some users as well in the future, but I cannot guarantee that if we can find some. So, if you know about music, if you are interested in music, seek help from some musicians as well to make this an acceptable plan. Thank you for sharing your input, but I don't think I am able to be involved with musicians. Me too. I have recently stopped being very involved in music and need to devote my energy to other projects. If it started, I would definitely use it and maybe add a few pages or edits, but I couldn't be much more involved than that. This is actually also one of the ideas that Jimbo mentioned in his speech. I'm willing to help. I'm in a relatively good amateur choir myself, and have some distant links to a very good student orchestra. Although not everything they play is old enough. I could try to persuade them to do something for the free music cause. That would be great. If we can record our own music, we may have free music. I was also wondering if that might be possible, I even thought of a Wipcochester. But that will be rather difficult I guess, because we will be from all over the world. I do have a few doubts about the feasibility of some of your proposed actions. As ex-performing choir singer, I know that sheet music can also be copyrighted by publishers who may have obtained those rights long time ago, but have survived even if the composer died more than 70 years ago. At least I do remember sets of sheet music that had prominent copyright markings on them, often in color to prevent all too easy copying. The piano excerpts I bought myself also carry a copyright notice. I was not really involved in the financial management of my choir, but I also vaguely recall some copyright items. Anyway, this should be investigated thoroughly before we invest a lot of time and effort in a project that might turn out to be an illegal activity. I still see the director of the choir every now and then, so I'll ask around next time I see him.
you will hear a report once. It is about three minutes long. Then six questions will appear. Choose the best way to answer each question from the drop-down menu. Anyone who has spent more than a few minutes on the internet will have come across the abusive and offensive comments that can reside on social networks and in comments sections. The comments are nothing new, they've existed since the dawn of the web in the 1990s. But what's changed is how quickly and how widely these messages can spread through social media. In the past year, Britain has started to crack down hard, using existing laws to prosecute comments made on Facebook and Twitter which break the law. In March, a 21-year-old student who posted racist tweets about footballer Fabrice Muamba as he lay, co lay collapsed on a football pitch was jailed for 56 days for a racially aggravated public disorder offence. Last August, two men who set up an event on Facebook encouraging people to riot in their hometowns were both sentenced to four years in prison for trying to incite disorder, despite the fact that no one actually showed up to the event. In one of the most infamous cases, a man who posted a tweet threatening to blow up an airport in England, which he said was light-hearted and a joke was found guilty by magistrates of sending a menacing electronic communication. The British government is planning to go further, this week it proposed new laws which would require internet service providers to unmask trolls who post defamatory comments online. The issue is gaining increased attention in the UK after several high-profile cases of online harassment, including jailing Frank Zimmerman the 60-year-old who sent threatening and offensive emails to a Conservative MP. But despite similar issues arising in Ireland, the situation is very different here. Technically anything that is said on the Internet is subject to the same laws as if it's published in any other format, in other words, the most likely charges that could be brought against a tweet or a status update are def defamation publication of a statement about someone which injures their reputation in the eyes of reasonable members of society, or incitement. In practice this means that calling someone the worst curse word you can think of is a crap thing to do on Twitter but is unlikely to break the law, but making an untrue allegation about could, as could encouraging or threatening someone else to commit a crime. It's worth bearing in mind that crude abuse is not defamation, and thus a lot of what goes on online will not ground a defamation action, explains Fergal Crenn, a Dublin-based barrister. The use of fake names on social networking sites also act as a barrier to cases being brought before the court.